Only 40% of people can create this natural molecule, according to these researchers. That nutrient or molecule is called urolithin A. Normally, when you consume fruits and nuts, which contain two polyphenols called elagitannin and elagic acid, these polyphenols are then converted to urolithin molecules, of which urolithin A is the dominant. This conversion happens inside your colon, where microbes of your microbiome absorb these polyphenols and, using bacterial enzymes called tannases, convert them to urolithins. However, as I mentioned in the very first sentence that I uttered upon thine ears, a good amount of people don't undergo this conversion. So the question lingering in your brain is, who cares? Well, it is believed that your lithins then get absorbed by the body and have wide reaching positive effects on the body from improved mitochondrial health, autophagy, muscle function, and more. So, this could be one reason why people experience deterioration of these areas of health over time. And we might be able to rescue these health effects by simply increasing our serum urolithin A. But is any of that actually true? Well, in this video, we'll be covering five studies on how urolithin A affects our mitochondria, autophagy, physical function, and so on. As forewarning, I'm going to get pretty critical of these studies on a number of fronts, but we'll get to a pretty solid answer and get some applicable takeaways on the topic nonetheless. Right off the bat, uh, let's look at urolithin A's effects on mitochondrial health. In this study, researchers isolated chondrocytes, which are cartilage cells, and measured their oxygen consumption rate with and without urolithin A exposure. Oxygen consumption is used as a proxy of mitochondrial activity. So the higher the oxygen consumption, the greater the activity, as we can see by this data. The vertical axis is the amount of oxygen consumption, aka mitochondrial activity, and the DMSO is the cells not exposed to urolithin A. And the other two conditions are a low and high exposure to urolithin A. As you can see, the urolithin conditions experienced increases in mitochondrial activity. But in full disclosure, this was not the case when trying to get mitochondria to be maximally active. Only one urolithin A condition experienced an increase. Now, the reason, in my estimation, is that they performed far fewer experiments. Each of those dots represents one datum. And if we compare the first data to the second data, just look at the number of experiments performed. So I would guess that they didn't do enough experiments to show an effect in the higher concentration. But that's educated speculation on my part. Anyway, it is likely that mitochondrial activity is enhanced. But that data was in healthy chondrocytes. So what happens when we apply it to chondrocytes from ligaments that are osteoarthritic, a pathological condition? Well, I'll show you both figures. The one on the left is the basal or resting oxygen consumption, and the one on the right is the maximally stimulated mitochondrial oxygen consumption. As you can see, both increase. All right, so from healthy tissue or not, your life in A seems to improve mitochondrial activity. How about autophagy? For that, the researchers used two different assays, but we'll focus on the more convincing one because the other one in isolation offers no real information. If you aren't familiar with autophagy, it's a massive mechanism within your cells that degrades large swaths of your cells. These giant membranes called autophagosomes envelop large sections of your cells, including organelles like mitochondria, and destroy them. They serve the function of removing dysfunctional components of your cells. There's much more complexity to the whole thing, but I'll leave it to my other content to explain those intricacies. Anyway, the researchers are loading mitochondria with a dye called mitotracker that stains the mitochondria red. It looks like this under a microscope. Then they measure autophagy by tracking how much mitochondria signal disappears. And guess what is making those mitochondria disappear? Well, it isn't the big bad wolf, it's autophagy. So looking at the data, you can see the mitotracker signal on the vertical axis and the different conditions on the horizontal axis. To walk you through, the uh, white bar is the cells that were not exposed to urolithin A, the control condition. The beige bar is the urolithin A condition. The gray bar is the cells not exposed to urolithin A, but exposed to an autophagy inhibitor. And the orange bar is the same, but with urolithin A exposure. Now, the last two bars are known as further controls for the experiment, essentially to prove that mitochondria are being destroyed through autophagy. 
we are the most interested in the comparison between the white bar and the beige bar. We see that urolithin A exposure reduces the number of mitochondria, indicating increased autophagy activity. Please do not read this thinking that urolithin A reduces the number of mitochondria in your cells. This is a specialized experiment for autophagy measures and only speaks to autophagy activity. Okay, so urolithin A increases mitochondrial activity and autophagy in cells. So does this translate to the whole human? Well, let's find out. Also, if you're interested in discovering urolithin A's role in inflammation, metabolism, heart disease, and some age-based differences, there's an extended version of this video that you're currently watching, which is found in my Physionic Insiders program. It belongs to a large library of other premium content that gets into even more detail that I can't cover normally. If you're interested, check out the link in the bio. But mull it over. We'll first go over the effects in humans now. This study, a randomized double-blind trial, investigated the effect that urolithin A supplementation had on men and women. They had people supplement for one month and took muscle tissue from each person before and after supplementation. Upon doing so, they measured a bunch of different gene expressions. Here's what that looks like. Well, <laughs> pretty overwhelming, isn't it? Well, don't worry. We don't need to look at that. They focused on a few genes that we'd be especially interested in, the mitochondria and autophagy genes. If we look at that data, which still looks a little daunting, but it's easy to read, I promise, the blue bars are the placebo condition, so no urolithin A supplementation. The orange bars are the low dose, and the red bars are the high dose. The vertical axis is the amount of gene expression as measured by mRNA, which is a molecule produced when our cells read and express our genes. The horizontal axis is a bunch of different genes related to autophagy. Instead of going through each one, I'll go ahead and tell you that the results are underwhelming. Although three of the genes have symbols above them, the hash symbol is actually a p-value between 0.05 and 0.15, which the standard is usually below 0.05. So across measures, the vast majority of autophagy genes were not affected by urolithin A supplementation. But how about mitochondria? Doing the exact same, looking at mRNA as a measure of gene expression, and we have four mitochondrial genes listed below. Again, we see only one gene is upregulated, but the p-value, the measure of statistical significance, leaves it much to be desired. So my interpretation, which you are free to disagree, is that urolithin A does not have a great effect on mitochondrial gene expression. However, the researchers also performed a gene set enrichment analysis, which means that they take all the genes related to a topic, like mitochondria, and group them together to determine if there is an increased gene expression across a multitude of related genes instead of isolating specific genes. According to that data, the results indicate that urolithin A may upregulate mitochondrial related genes when looking at far more than just the four that we looked at earlier. The data is normalized to the placebo, so we only see two colors, the low and high urolithin A conditions. If you see the bar, either color extend from the vertical axis, then there is an increased gene expression in that group of genes compared to the placebo. This may be a bit complex, or I just may be doing a horrible job explaining it. So, well, I guess just trust me that there's some increased mitochondrial gene expression. Still, all this taken together, I find myself rather underwhelmed. But as Shakespeare once said, ye of little faith needeth analyzeth furtherth data to quell the ruin of hope's despair. So let me introduce you to some more positive results. The researchers of this study had participants consume urolithin A for four months and then measured a number of functional measures, meaning performance metrics like muscle strength, VO2, and measures of that sort. Encouragingly, they found better results. Here, we're looking at hamstring and quadricep strength. Both are parts of the legs for all you nothing but chest lifters. We have the placebo in purple, each dot representing an individual person's results, and the other two conditions, orange and red, being the urolithin A conditions. As you can plainly see, both urolithin A conditions improved. The assumption here as well is that these people were not resistance training or trying to improve these metrics, but the evidence was mixed. Other metrics of strength, like hand grip strength, did not improve. 
Yet VO2, which is a measure of oxygen utilization by the body and tends to associate well with mitochondrial health, did likely improve, but only in those consuming urolithin A at the highest concentrations. So isn't this confusing? Well, yes, but it won't be for long. I am surprised some of these studies were published in such high profile journals, not because the data is disappointing, but because some of the measures aren't exactly great quality. But let's put that aside and base the conclusions on what we have at hand. I didn't make a big deal out of this, but the effect sizes or the amount of impact experienced with your life and a is really small. So if we assume based on limited data that your life and a does improve mitochondrial health and has functional benefits like improved muscle function and improved VO2, the effects are small. It's entirely up to you if you feel that the investment is worth it, but don't expect huge returns on investment. Still, there are other supplements that do show more promise. So if you'd like to hear more about those, simply click on this next video right here, and I think you'll find it worth your while. I'll speak with you there. Bye. Thank you.